Uh, good morning to everybody. I'm Paolo Fraccaro, uh, first year PhD student in the center and I'm founded by the NIHR Greater Manchester uh, Primary Care Patient Safety Translational Research Center. And today I'm going to tell you about the rationale behind my project uh, and uh, um, some experiments that uh, we are doing uh, at the moment. Since the, it's the first time that I have actually the chance to speak uh, in front of uh, the all of you, uh, a little bit uh, about uh, myself. I'm originally from Genoa, uh, a very beautiful city, as you can see in the picture, and uh, the homeland of uh, pesto sauce, the famous pesto sauce, and something uh, you might recollect of, such as your flag, which originally is uh, from uh, my city. I'm uh, a biomedical engineer's background, uh, and uh, in the last uh, couple of years, uh, I've worked on semantic interoperability, clinical decision support, uh, and uh, signal analysis in wearable technologies. Uh, when I started uh, uh, looking at the literature for my project, uh, uh, after a while, uh, uh, it was clear that uh, the most challenging issue uh, in terms of patient safety in uh, um, primary care is uh, multimorbidity. Multimorbidity, um, which is defined uh, as any combination of chronic disease uh, with at least uh, uh, one other disease or biopsychosocial factor or somatic factor. So we have uh, um, a quite broad definition of this condition uh, to consider the uh, whole context uh, of patients. And uh, the prevalence in the population has been estimated uh, from past studies uh, as 23% and 29% uh, in uh, um, Scotland and the Netherlands. Uh, although this is mostly related uh, uh, to um, elderly, there is a higher prevalence in the population at younger ages in the private areas. Uh, the uh, diseases which uh, usually concur uh, are mostly um, uh, chronic and uh, we have cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, chronic kidney disease, chronic musculoskeletal disorders, chronic lung disorders and uh, mental disorders as well. Um, we have an economic uh, burden related to multimorbidity. In fact, it has been estimated that uh, in the US Medicare, about 85% uh, uh, of uh, the total health expenditure is uh, related to multimorbid patients, uh, who in England uh, are accounted to the majority of uh, uh, primary care encounters. Having more than one condition uh, generates uh, uh, possible interaction between pathologies, uh, duplication of tests, uh, difficulties in adhering uh, um, to often conflicting uh, clinical practice guidelines uh, without uh, uh, any guideline about how to integrate them. Uh, there are uh, uh, big obstacles uh, in the continuity of care because of the many healthcare providers uh, uh, involved in patient care. Uh, and confusing uh, self-management inf information where uh, self-management uh, plays a key role uh, in, uh, uh, to manage this condition. And uh, uh, finally, because of the many treatments, uh, uh, possibility of medication errors. So overall, uh, patient safety issues and uh, iatrogenic risk. To put that uh, just uh, uh, in, uh, in practice in uh, one example, um, Boyd et al. applied the clinical practice guidelines uh, to a hypothetical case of a, a 79 years old uh, woman, not particularly severe, with the five uh, um, chronic conditions. Uh, and uh, the treatment uh, from the guideline was composed of uh, 14 non-pharmacologic uh, uh, treatments uh, and 12 uh, unique uh, uh, medications uh, with 19 doses, doses per day. So in this context, uh, uh, something uh, as uh, clinical decision support uh, could be very helpful. Uh, and uh, to figure out uh, to what uh, extent and uh, level of complexity clinical decision support uh, uh, was adopted uh, in uh, uh, multimorbidity, we did a systematic review of the literature. Um, I'm not going into much detail uh, about this, uh, uh, but uh, the important uh, inclusion criteria was that uh, uh, to be included, uh, um, a clinical genome support intervention had uh, uh, to be uh, patient-centered. So following patient-centered approach, which uh, is uh, the one identified as the most suitable 
to address uh, uh, multimorbidity. Uh, we found just uh, only 20 studies uh, um, uh, which uh, respected the inclusion criteria. Uh, prescription was uh, the most uh, addressed uh, uh, clinical task, uh, but using uh, fixed rules. Uh, uh, another main task uh, was uh, uh, merging uh, concurring clinical practice guidelines, uh, uh, which uh, uh, had already been defined by CITIG in his uh, paper from 2008, one of the grand challenges in clinical decision support. In this case, uh, we found uh, uh, a few studies, uh, but uh, the complexity was limited to two clinical practice guidelines, uh, and uh, uh, the interaction with the end user was uh, needed. Uh, only one study looked at uh, continuity of care, and uh, uh, no uh, patients uh, uh, as final users or uh, interventions uh, uh, to um, improve uh, self-management of multi uh, multiple conditions uh, uh, were found. Finally, a common theme in clinical decision support, uh, such as uh, no rigorous evaluation. So, putting together uh, the evidence uh, from uh, multimorbidity and uh, the evidence uh, about uh, this uh, from this uh, systematic review, uh, the conclusion was that to be effective in multimorbidity clinical decision support. Uh, has to be aware of the specific context of the patient and information in electronic care records could be used to achieve this. On the line of these conclusions, I'll tell you about this ongoing project where we are trying to use a mixed effects model to produce patient-tailored alerts for abnormal laboratory results. The rationale behind uh, this project uh, is that, uh, uh, above all, uh, in presence of multimorbidity, we can have uh, uh, systematically altered uh, uh, biological functions uh, uh, because of treatments, uh, because of the diseases. Accordingly, um, the um, fixed thresholds used at the moment so the ones calculated uh, through the 95% 95, 95 per, uh, confidence interval for the healthy population uh, uh, might be uh, relevant in the majority of cases, uh, but uh, uh, there is a, a significant proportion uh, of alerts uh, that uh, might not be uh, helpful in the specific context uh, of a patient. Um, and uh, more important, uh, sudden, uh, patient-specific uh, changes inside the reference ranges uh, are not detected uh, by fixed rules. Um, this is why we uh, decided to use uh, uh, this uh, uh, mixed effect model. And uh, in the figure, there is a comparison uh, between uh, the standard method, the one used now, the green lines, uh, and uh, the patient-tailored uh, method, so the one from the mixed effect model. Uh, we can observe that <laughs> this uh, mixed effect model, uh, as soon as information about the patient can tailor the 95% to the specific observation of the patient. In this case, we have a series of potassium observations. And this generates uh, uh, three different uh, cases. So values alerted by both uh, methods, values alerted uh, by just the standard method, and values alerted just by the patient tailor method inside the common reference ranges. Uh, we did uh, some experiments uh, using uh, a quite uh, large uh, uh, extract from uh, SIR, and uh, we uh, fit the model on this data set, uh, uh, keeping out uh, from uh, uh, the, the modeling uh, about 500 patients. Then, uh, because of the, um, uh, the method we used uh, to um, test the uh, method, we used uh, um, the uh, patients with at least three records, about 312. Uh, the first thing we can observe is that uh, the standard method produce uh, more alerts uh, than uh, the patient tailor method. However, it's inter interesting uh, to notice that the vast majority of uh, patient tailored alerts were common with uh, the standard alerts. 
to uh, evaluate the uh, potential utility of these alerts, we set up an experiment. So from the produced alerts, we uh, randomly selected 10 alerts for each type, 10 just standard, 10 just patient tailored, and uh, 10 common alerts. And uh, we uh, showed uh, pictures uh, similar to uh, the ones uh, on the slide uh, to three different uh, um, clinical experts uh, asking for the potential uh, um, clinical relevance of uh, the value alerted. Uh, I know that uh, this is quite uh, artificial because we provided the uh, user um, uh, experts uh, just uh, with uh, the values, uh, the ages uh, and uh, the gender of the patient. But in this phase of this project, we wanted to have a broad idea about the potential of the method. Um, looking at the majority decision, uh, um, all uh, common alerts were judged as uh, relevant and uh, helpful. Uh, not uh, all uh, the values alerted by only the standard method were judged uh, um, as uh, helpful, uh, and this is the method used at the moment. And 50% uh, of the values alerted only the patient tailored method uh, uh, were judged, uh, judged as uh, uh, relevant. And uh, these values uh, would have been missed uh, with uh, the standard uh, uh, method. So to conclude, uh, these preliminary results uh, seem to show that uh, uh, tailoring alerts for abnormal results, uh, uh, we could provide uh, physicians, uh, clinicians with helpful information. A, a possible technical solution could be a system which uh, combines together um, these two methods uh, may be using different colors to alert uh, value. And uh, in the future, uh, um, since in the electronic records there is a lot of information uh, uh, that could be reused, such as age, uh, gender, comorbidities, treatments, uh, and one of the reasons why we decided to use uh, this mixed effect model is that we can integrate these variables directly in, uh, in the modeling, uh, we plan uh, to extend uh, our analysis in this, uh, in this way. And finally, to fully test uh, the effectiveness uh, of uh, uh, these uh, alerts, uh, we are investigating clinical scenarios uh, where we can, for example, calculate the number of alerts uh, before uh, of uh, adverse events. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Do you think that changes um, the averting prediction interaction or fatigue situation? Um, I think that uh, this is a variable that uh, might completely change the analysis because, of course, uh, this is very personal. How do I feel? How uh, I, I think that uh, this value it's, my, it's not relevant uh, for me. Uh, the uh, inclusion of patients uh, in projects uh, such as these, because we are uh, looking at specific uh, uh, observation of specific patients, might be interesting uh, in the future. I, I don't know if uh, the perception of the patient uh, about their health uh, from a clinical point of view could be uh, helpful to clinicians. I think the rationale of like a low hemoglobin level, the patient feels okay. The implications about the difference to someone's feeling very miserable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 no, in, in that. Yeah, 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 in that way, yes. I have a question. It's about the value of the To me, uh, the, the method is not quite complicated because I, I didn't uh, go into detail about that, but uh, we have a model that can be fit, uh, other variables can, we, can be integrated. Um, of course, in this 
phase, uh, we just looked at uh, potential uh, utility according to uh, experts, uh, and this is the first step. A success uh, uh, could be to test, as I, as I said, uh, if uh, uh, integrating these methods uh, could provide information to maybe predict uh, adverse events and these kind of uh, uh, things. But the great success uh, would be maybe to test, test it in practice with uh, a clinical pr uh, trial and these kind of uh, evaluations. But of course, it's something very complicated uh, to do. So I I'm not sure I, I will be able to achieve it in my PhD. Uh, of course, uh, there is uh, a, a big uh, problem in uh, this moment uh, since there is no guideline uh, to merge uh, these different uh, clinical practice guidelines. And as I've shown in the example, there are cases where you have three, four, five uh, conditions. Um, um, in uh, 2014, uh, I think in March, uh, um, NICE uh, uh, developed a, a document uh, which uh, goes in that uh, direction. So, of course, they, they know about uh, uh, this issue. Uh, the problem is that uh, there, the, from the medical point of view, from, from the clinical point of view, there is no evidence about how to integrate them because, uh, for example, multi-barbit patients are very often excluded uh, by clinical trials because of the inclusion criteria very strict uh, to not uh, uh, like uh, alter the results of the trial. So reusing data in uh, electronic records could be useful for uh, clinical decision support, uh, but uh, to look at multimorbid patients in uh, a, a real environment and to um, infer clinical evidence as well, in my opinion. Yeah. I didn't hear the beginning of it. It increases the relevance of your nerves, at least that's what you're going for. Yeah. Um, but the actual problem is if you get on the nerves, yeah. what, what do you need to do? What does the clinician need to do? And that's the part of the problem that most of the patients have. If you have a question, do you have any specific ideas on that step? Uh, this is, yeah, th this is a very good point. At the moment, uh, we are trying to identify these abnormal uh, values uh, for the patients, like the one I showed. It was inside the reference range, but it was uh, a, um, a drop of uh, one point of potassium, so maybe relevant. Um, I have uh, uh, one uh, clinical expert, uh, um, Ben Brown, uh, works with me, and uh, we will investigate that. It's, it's a very good point. At the moment, I, I'm, I don't uh, have the clinical background to reply to the question. 